Well, it's noon, we're recording. So uh, we're getting serious about our meeting now. Good afternoon. Uh, so happy to see you here on voting in election day, which is a big day to the League of Women Voters. Uh, we have Tuesday topics every uh, the first Tuesday of every month. So we're glad to have guests. All our meetings are public. Someday we will be back at the library, but I think we're gonna stay on Zoom for a little while and uh, continue to make sure we're safe and let the library be our guide about when we start meeting in person again. I like to remind us of who we are. We're a nonpartisan non organization that promotes political responsibility through informed and active participation of citizens in government. A um, couple things really quickly before I ask for announcements and introduce our speaker. One is um, there's a lot happening now with redistricting. Uh, I would suggest if you wanted to learn a lot to go to our League of Women Voters uh, uh, homepage, lwvtsc.org, and uh, read about fair votes, fair maps, and the public meetings that the legislature is planning right now uh, with lots of questions about how open they want to be to the public on this redistricting process in Kansas. I also wanted to say, save the date. Uh, the League is partnering with the YWCA of Northeast Kansas and several other organizations to have a candidate forum for um, mayor and council positions. That'll be September 28th. That'll be either at the library or on Zoom. Uh, we'll just have to work, just stand loose about that one at this point. Does anybody else have an announcement? Kind of our rules for uh, Tuesday topics is keep your audio muted. You can decide if you want to show your face or not, keep your video on or off. Uh, we like to have the questions and answers at the end of the presentation rather than during. Uh, write them in the chat box. Uh, our vice incoming president, Mary Lou, will ask the questions of the speakers and Lisa and the library will help us if we're having trouble with Zoom or you have a friend who has. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Ann Ma, who's our main speaker, who will be introducing the rest of our speakers. And Ann's a lifelong Kansan with a resume um, that's very long and very distinguished. Uh, she's a former legislator, uh, and now she represents District 4 on the state school board. She raised and born out at Hayesville near, near Wichita, went to Emporia State, um, degrees in science and um, then curri curriculum. So education is a longtime interest, and then ended up retiring from um, Southwestern Bell. She's had a lot of leadership positions, United Way, ABWA, um, and the Lutheran Fine Arts Council. So without taking a lot more time, I would like to introduce Anne. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Very good. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you guys having me today and my guests who I will introduce shortly. I've been asked to share with you today what is going on in public schools with civic engagement. And I'm excited to do that because we have a lot going on in our, in our public schools. And since today I'm on the mothership of civic engagement with the League of Women Voters, <laughs> uh, I hope that you'll be excited about what we're doing as well. And I just wanna thank you guys for all your work, particularly against voter suppression, which is near and dear to me as well. Uh, I brought some friends with me from the Seaman District as they are champions at civic engagement and you will meet them shortly. I want to back up a little bit to tell you how we got where we are today. Back in 2015, the State Board and the Kansas State Department of Education staff toured Kansas and held more than 200 focus groups with more than 2,000 parents, business people, and educators to ask the question, 
what does a successful 24 year old look like and what role does K-12 education play in that? The answers that came back told us that academics were important, but only about 20 to 25% of what makes a person successful. They were all more concerned about things like social emotional growth, technical skills, employability skills, and civic engagement. They identified citizenship, ethics, and duty to others as critical interpersonal social skills required for their students' success. In response to that, the State Board actually changed the measurements we use for district accreditation. Academics are still important. We measure those six ways from Sunday. But now we look even more closely at the other things that Kansans asked for, including civic engagement. So to that end, we created the Civic Advocacy Network. The purpose of the Civic Advocacy Network is to recognize schools that actively involve students in civic engagement opportunities and collect exemplary practices to share with schools across the state. We actually host a statewide civic advocacy showcase where schools and students can share their best ideas and practices for civic engagement. It's quite a showcase. The ultimate goal is to promote civic engagement as part of all pre through K-12 student experiences. We think that works best when civic engagement is incorporated actually into all aspects of the curriculum and not just isolated into one course. I mentioned that we now include civic engagement in our district accreditation. So I have a short five minute video clip that will tell you, this is what we tell schools we would like to see them do in terms of civic engagement. So Carol, if you can run that clip for us. Hang on here. should be coming up. Doesn't look like you clicked on it or it didn't go anyway. Carol, it might have opened in a different screen than the one that you're sharing also. Mm. Her computer might have frozen. Uh-oh. Carol, you're on mute. What I get is a message that that may have moved. I am not sure what to do to okay. get it. Well, I'll just tell you then a bit about what it is that we expect schools to do and the things that we look at when we do uh, school accreditation. We define civic engagement as individuals sharing their skills and knowledge through actions intended to improve communities, states, nations, the world, and themselves. We have several areas where we ask the schools to engage students. One is civic skills, which is the ability to participate like vote um, in the Democratic Republic. We ask them to engage students in civic knowledge which begins with a fundamental understanding of the structure of government, the processes by which laws and policy are made, the three areas of government, if you will. Civic actions, voting, volunteering, participating, collaborating, collaborating and compromising, and civic intent, a personal commitment to ideals that are important in a democracy. So schools have a variety of ways that they can demonstrate to us that they are actually presenting authentic learning to students 
with civic engagement. And um, it's not like schools don't have plenty to do already, plenty on their plate, particularly in the COVID environment. But we think this matters to their future and the future of our country. We asked them to take an integrated approach to civic engagement. And I wanted to show you today and demonstrate what that looks like when a school does it really well. And that's why I invited our friends from the Seaman District to tell you about what they do. Seaman schools take civic engagement seriously and they've won multiple awards over the years through our network. And I will let them tell you all about it. And to do that, let me introduce to you Danita Fernandez Flores, who is the Director of Secondary Education at Seaman USD 345. Danita? You're gonna... Uh, good, good morning, and thank you for the invitation. As uh, Ms. Ma said, I'm Benita Fernandez Flores, Director of Secondary Education here at Seaman. I'm in the same room as Becky Kramer, and to ensure that we don't have echoes, we are running audio through her computer, but then you'll be able to see our faces uh, together. And uh, Becky, you can introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm the director of early childhood and elementary education for Seaman Schools. Uh, I also have one of our principals with us, Ms. Kelly Finnegan. She's the principal at North Fairview. And um, even though we are directors, the true magic happens in schools with principals, teachers, and of course, the magicians being the students who put it all together. So I'd like for them to introduce themselves. Uh, Ms. Sittenauer, we can start with you. Tell us what you do at Seaman High School. Hi, uh, my name is Susan Sittenauer, and this is my 37th year at Seaman High School teaching uh, civil and criminal rights in U.S. history. And um, I'm the History Day sponsor and the Crime Stopper sponsor. And I have worked with the League of Women Voters. Um, Rick Reinberg, a colleague of mine, and I have uh, worked with the voter registration and um, I was fortunate enough uh, for the league sent me to myself and another teacher from Topeka High to Harvard a, a few years back to learn the case method study. And also we have uh, the people that we are here to serve, which is a student representing our student body. Olivia, why don't you introduce yourself to us and all the things that you do at our campus? Um, hello, everybody. I'm very honored to be able to join you today. Uh, my name is Olivia Oliva. I'm currently a senior at Seaman High School, so I'll be graduating in 2022. Um, I have the pleasure to have the opportunity for all of these activities at the school, just like I'm in Model UN, uh, Debate and Forensics, and the Equity Action Council and the Equity Action Network. So I'm very honored to be able to go to the school and have all those opportunities. Kelly? We already did. Okay. Um, and uh, Ms. Ma, if you would like, we can start our presentation. Yes, that's fine. Go ahead. Becky, mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you again for having us. Um, we do like to share the story of Seaman. We work in a community uh, that is very much engaged uh, civically. You can see that in the culture of the environment in our school buildings. Um, when the, the Civic Advocacy Network first came out with the Civic Engagement um, Award, it was very interesting for us at the Teaching and Learning Department to look at the award criteria and to recognize that this described semen. This is what our semen learning community uh, attempts to do to build our students. And, uh, and so when we looked at the criteria, which is instruction in government, history, law, and democracy, and we looked at our curriculum, how robust it was in those areas, we thought, you know, that, that describes us. And then we looked at another piece, which was incorporating the discussion of current local, national, international issues and events in the classroom, particularly those that are very important in the lives of our students. And we noticed that that is what our teachers do in the classroom, provide that space and opportunity uh, for students to engage in those topics that they're interested in. 
Then the, another element was the design and implementation of programs that provide students with opportunities to apply what they've learned uh, in community service uh, scenarios. And as you will hear a little later on, we have a vast opportunities for our students and interest in those areas. And then extracurricular activities uh, for our students to be involved. Our district has a goal that every student will participate in at least two activities. And at this point, we have approximately 79% of our students participating in two or more activities and some participating in one. And so that is part of our culture, our endeavor to ensure our students are participating in extracurricular activities. We encourage student governance in, at various levels, as well as, as not only simulations in the democratic process, but actual participation in that democratic process. So when we looked at that civic um, network, advocacy um, rubric, we knew that it described our, our school district. And so, as Ms. Moss said earlier, the definition of civic engagement is individuals sharing their skills and knowledge through action intended to improve community, states, nations, the world, and themselves. And then I want to show you something really interesting. Go to the mission statement. Mm -hmm. In our mission statement, it, uh, I'm not seeing it. It's coming. In yes. our mission statement, you will notice that we are about preparing each student for lifelong success through strong and healthy <clears throat> relationships. As we talked earlier about social emotional being so important, rigorous and relevant learning, academically rigorous and responsive, and a caring culture that maximizes student talents and aspirations. But this is the part that sets semen apart and community contributions in our community here, we believe that not only should our students be self-actualizing, they should take those talents and skills and employ them in, in contributions to our community. And so this is why there is such a great connection between the goals of our state in the area of civic engagement and, and the kind of culture that we have here in our learning community. And so as we move into the rest of the slides to share with you our story and to have our teacher and our principal and our student uh, explain what we're about, um, just keep those things in mind. And so um, as you can see, um, part of the instruction is in how we uh, conduct instruction, which would be in that project-based learning concept. So I'm going to invite Ms. Sittenauer to talk about project-based learning and Olivia to share about the projects she's uh, participated in. Thank you. Um, well, within uh, the curriculum at Seaman High School, all juniors will complete a project. Um, and this project encompasses uh, the analyzing of primary sources, um, the difference between primary and secondary sources, recognizing bias in, in sources, and being able to then take those sources and analyze them. And then they do have an annotated bibliography that they um, show where all their, you know, what are all their sources. And then they take all of that and encompass it into some project form, whether that be an exhibit, a website, um, a performance, a documentary, or a research paper. Um, we encourage our students to enter their projects into a local competition called National History Day, that then if they qualify for state and or nationals in College Park, Maryland. Um, Olivia, would you did you have a project last year that you completed for history? I actually, took AP US history. So it's more like a college course. And we did many, many projects similar to this, but my history day project was just an essay over um, Asian Americans and their history and triumphs in America, so. Elementary. Elementary. All right, um, in order to um, kind of foster that um, those basic skills and to um, do some of that longitudinal and vertical alignment with our high school, middle school and high school, elementary schools have most recently also um, begun doing project-based learning units um, per semester. So we engage our students in a question that is related to the theme, uh, social studies theme that their grade level is responsible for. So for example, our kindergarten students, their theme is for the year is the world around us. First grade, it's families living and working together. Um, third grade um, or second grade is neighborhoods and community. 
And then we get up into fourth and fifth grade where we start talking about America, uh, states and regions and the United States, things like that. So some of the questions that we pose uh, for the kids to think about, and then they actually do the research and they come up with some solutions. Um, like second grade is neighborhoods and community. Uh, we ask kid, the kids, um, how can we bring change to our community? And then they'll design something, maybe a business or a park or something that will make their community be a better place. They'll have to research it and then be um, prepared to present that to their class or to their parents. Um, another example of fourth grade might be the American states and regions. And um, so fourth grade students would be asked um, how Kansans, um, famous Kansas have impacted the history of our state. So those are a couple of the examples. And then they end up doing quite a bit of research and asking more questions and, and um, able to put together some sort of project to be able to share out. The other thing we've done around providing instruction in these areas is we were very intentional about making sure that we provided the resources for our staff. So we, two years ago, purchased a curriculum called Into Social Studies. It's, it's magazine-based and it's also got a lot of online resources that staff can access current events online, watch videos about current topics in the country and across um, our nation. And so very intentional with making sure that we have really strong vetted resources in place. Mm -hmm. yeah, another really important element of this is the incorporation of discussion of current events that are important to our students. And we have not only um, we, we don't only have a clubs where students are able to engage in that work. So for instance, the Civic Engagement Club, and maybe Ms. Sittenauer can help me with elaborating on this, but our students uh, proposed to the legislature um, the change of the name of a highway for a particular reason. Ms. Sittenauer, could you speak to that? Um, well, so we had a teacher in our building um, that worked with a number of students to uh, rename a, a part of a highway after a person, a Kansan, a local uh, individual man uh, with regard, and had participated in the Civil War. And um, the students actually wrote the bill themselves and spoke before the committee in our state legislature and were able to get that bill pushed through. Um, and it was a really rewarding experience for our students to see the positive change that they themselves could do um, and that it wasn't just something that came down from above, that they, it was a grassroots effort and it really um, made a great impact on them. We also um, had a representative come speak to our students to engage in a discourse. Can you help us with that? So at, um, at different points in time throughout the time I've been at SEMA, we've had a number of representatives and state um, leaders in our state legislature and in our US Congress come and speak to our students. And it has been a very interactive um, discussion. It wasn't just that he came in and, and you know, he or she came in and gave a speech. It was a, a very um, vibrant um, back and forth between the students and the representative or senator um, that, that came to speak to the students. Um, and, Kind of to piggyback onto that on the last slide, I had that the League of Women Voters, when they come and give their present, when you your representatives give your presentation, the students are very interested in everything that um, the the facts that you present and the I, the questions that you ask them. And um, I believe last year we had over 200 seniors registered to vote, and they were and on on in November on voter. Uh, on the election day, we had a large number of our students able to participate in that process. Olivia, could you speak on um, the Equity Action Network and the purpose of that uh, group? Yes, um, so I've had the opportunity to be a part of the Equity Action Network since it began. We kind of started in the middle of the summer last year, and it's one of the best things I've been able to be a part of. What the purpose of the Equity Action Network is, is to build a more inclusive and a caring environment for every student. Um, in a time where there is so much happening, COVID and so many different um, world events, we definitely, it's a hard place to be in as a student and having to live through all of that. And so what the purpose of the Equity Action Network is, is 
for every different and unique student there is at the school, we want to create a more inclusive and um, caring environment so that they have the opportunity to have the confidence to be a part of each activity that we have to offer. Um, right now, we've been able to um, change some of the curriculum of our school and realize that students have the power to say, this is what we want and this is what we need to change. And one of the things that the Equity Action Network is so great about is giving students a voice in what they get to learn every day. And I'm so excited to see where it goes and what happens this next school year. Yeah. Uh, again, at the elementary level, um, we look at current events, uh, our intermediate grades look and use a resource called CNN News. Um, it's a, the, the kid version, so it's very tailored to um, our intermediate students, and uh, we're able to facilitate classroom discussions about topics that are, um, be, you know, uh, occurring across our country, things that they may hear their parents talk about or see on the news are able to be replicated and talked about um, and discussed in our classrooms. And um, implementing programs or applying what they've learned in the community. Um, one example is the service learning day. And so here's a one minute video on the impact that our students have. I'm Michael Conway and I'm a senior at Seaman High School. Uh, today was our senior service work day, so we're here helping with Operation Backpack and other things that the North Peak Outreach does. And this is just one site among many across the city of Topeka, and we have over 300 seniors in the city of Topeka giving back to the community because that's what Seaman High School and Seaman School Districts is all about, is giving back and being a part of the community. Teresa Gardner with Topeka North Outreach and I just want to come here today and say thank you, thank you to all of the Seaman High School students that are going throughout the community serving and helping and all of the agencies in Topeka need volunteers. We need help and so it's so valuable to have uh, volunteers, especially young, strong, energetic volunteers and we just thank you for your help, Seaman High School. Not only do we take opportunities like that, but our curriculum, for instance, our construction pathway um, is partnered with Habitat for Humanity. And so for many years, our students have been building homes for uh, that organization. All right, at the elementary level, I'm going to let uh, Ms. Finnegan talk a little bit about her multi-aged families. Um, this is a project that she's been doing for several years, and I'm going to let her elaborate on what they do. All right, so at North Fairview, what we do is we take our entire student population and we break them down into smaller groups. So uh, multi-age, so each group would consist of students in grades kindergarten through sixth grade. And we partner with various outreach programs in the community um, that we can offer support to. And so it's really great for our students um, to not only be able to learn about the different um, programs that are out there and how we can give to them, but also, you know, maybe some of our students are in need of services from that program. So they really get to learn about it. So um, some of the projects that we've done in the past is um, Ronald McDonald House. Um, we have collected um, pop tabs and, and turned that into money for them. Um, we have researched about harvesters and donated to them. Um, North Topeka Outreach, uh, the Red Cross. Um, we've gone to nursing homes and um, like we sang to them at Christmas time. Um, we do a what's called a senior holiday tea, where we reach out to not grandparents of students, but just uh, more elderly people in our community and bring them into the school and give our students opportunities to visit with them and kind of learn about, you know, their generation and, and kind of share about what's going on in school today. Um, and then this year, we're going to be working on the um, Project Linus, which is a program that provides blankets to students in hospitals. And um, we're going to do um, Children's Mercy does happy kits for students um, in the hospital as well. So they'll be learning about those and um, creating kits and making blankets, and we will be able to donate to those um, programs as well. I'm Michael Conway, and I'm a senior at Uh, 
and we offer many opportunities for extracurricular activities as well. And I'll have uh, Ms. Wittenauer talk about some of those. All right. So um, with the Crime Stoppers Board, I thought I was on mute. Sorry. With the Crime Stoppers Board, um, we uh, have a board of students with, um, I would say, about 10 students who their goal is to work with local law enforcement authorities. And we work with the Shawnee County Crime Stoppers organization. And um, basically it's, it's, a, it's mostly preventive in nature, trying to put information um, out to students um, in different formats to let them know um, that there are opportunities to anonymously, um, if they see something, to report it. Um, but one thing that there's two new things that are coming down with, uh, with regard to the Crime Stoppers is that they have an app now that they're going to train us on this fall. And it's um, completely anonymous. And, and I think it's going to be an app that's going to go on. Our IT is going to put maybe on every student's laptop. And, um, and one of the things that Crime Stoppers um, has said that they have been really successful with uh, other schools is uh, suicide prevention with the Crime Stoppers app. So that's kind of a different take and, and direction than what we normally think of and re with regard to, you know, maybe theft or that type of thing. Also, our programming includes a pathway related to broadcasting and that some of the skills that our students learn in that pathway are used in service of our learning community. So for instance, what you see here is a video of um, a PSA announcement against cyberbullying. So can you just play a few seconds? Mm -hmm. Cyberbullying is a very real thing. Affecting over half of young adults online, it is generally done by bullies called trolls. These trolls will invade your privacy and ruin your social media experience. So our students uh, dive into topics that are important to them, that impact them, and they find solutions and try to uh, promote uh, better behaviors. And so that's another example of uh, the work we do. All right, at the elementary level, we tried to also offer some extracurricular activities utilizing some of the community resources that we have. Um, we do a running club across the district. Uh, many of the schools partner with the Girls on the Run um, through the YWCA. Uh, Kelly at North Fairview also instituted some after school programming through Starbase up through uh, Forbes Field. And I'm going to let her talk a little bit about what that program looked like. Okay, Starbase is a great program. Um, they do have something that they offer for fifth grade where our students get to go to Forbes Field and kind of learn about space and, and different technology. Um, but then they have a program that we can implement in the schools. Um, it's an after school program. It's for sixth grade. And it really focuses on um, STEM activities. So our students have opportunities to um, just excel in the areas of science and technology and engineering and math. And they provide all of the materials and, and curriculum that we need. And so it's a really great program for our sixth graders. Cyberbullying is a very real thing. We also like to encourage uh, participation in school governance. We have the traditional student council and student advisory, but sometimes there are other opportunities that arise. In our district, um, we have um, a community issue that we are attempting to address, and that is our namesake. And when we are engaging in difficult conversations in our district, we don't shy away from ensuring that our students have a voice and participation in that process. And so Olivia is a member of the namesake, um, namesake committee, which is tasked with helping our community navigate this uh, question that has come up. So Olivia, can you share what uh, your role and responsibilities are in a committee such as that? As that? Yes, um, so I am on the namesake committee. I've been able to have so many new opportunities with that. Um, I'm the only student on the committee. The rest are adults and people in our community. So it's definitely a different experience for me. And my role is basically representing the students and making sure those voices are heard. Um, it's such a issue that affects all parts of our community. It doesn't just affect one piece. And so students are definitely one of the biggest ones that 
definitely have a voice and definitely have their opinions. So I will actually be speaking at the board meeting on um, August 9th, talking to the board about our progress of what we're doing, what we're planning to do and um, how we're going to do that, so. Okay, at the elementary level, we also replicate uh, student council. Kelly, do you wanna talk a little bit about what that election process looks like? Sure, in the building? sure. Yes, um, our students in fifth and sixth grade um, can uh, fill out an application if that's something that they want to do. And then it's reviewed by a team of teachers, just making sure they're in good standing, um, both beha with behavior and academics. And then they get to campaign and uh, make posters and a short video about themselves. They get shared with the entire student population. And then um, we go through the election process and as uh, students are able to vote um, on members of our student council. And then they meet once a month and and discuss concerns or things that they may want to um, bring up that, that may want they want may want change. Um, and then also they have done some different service projects as well. Um, one story that I love to tell about our student council is that students wanted um, our field updated um, for soccer because it wasn't very level. And so we kind of discussed with them, you know, well, what what would you need to do to try to make that happen? And um, they were able to, you know, take pictures and interview different classmates and um, design a plan. And they presented that to our PTO and our PTO um, spent $2,000 to go ahead and level out um, the ground and reseed it and everything so they would have a soccer field. So um, it's just important for us to um, let our students know that they have a voice and that they can they can make changes. And uh, Ms. Nauer can uh, share with us the other manners in which we encourage uh, the simulation of the democratic process. Okay, so uh, junior boys and girls um, become, they, they are recommended by their teachers, a certain number of uh, junior boys and a certain number of junior girls are, um, names are put forth and then they are asked if they would be uh, able to or would consider going and being a part of Girl State or Boy State. And Girl State and Boy State, is an they are both excellent organizations that really are having students dive right in the democratic process. They run for office, whether it be governor or a representative or a mayor or all the different levels of local and state um, offices are represented. And they they go, it's a, it's a high level simulation that they are involved in when they go to Boys and Girls State. And they, um, they, they communicate, they network. And um, it's a really, op really completely awesome opportunity for our young people to um, actually be a part of and, and simulate being uh, a governor or being a part of uh, a legislature. Um, we also have students um, that participate in Model, U Model UN. Uh, Mr. Cromie is the the teacher who runs the Model UN. And again, that's another high level simulation. And we also have had students for um, probably at least 15 years be a part of the Shawnee County Youth Court where they are actually the judge, the bailiff, the clerk, the attorney representing real, real students, real minors who commit misdemeanors and then they get a diversion. And so we've had um, students that I would say role playing, but it, it is a, a legitimate court that it act. It are, it's actually students who committed misdemeanor crimes that go there and are being judged by people of their peers. Their peers are the jury members and, and so on. Olivia, could you share um, your experiences in Model UN? Yeah, so Model UN is definitely one of the greatest experience I've I've been able to have. It's really something like none other. It's um, exercising parliamentary procedure. We're debating bills. We're passing bills. We're adding amendments to bills. And I even had the opportunity to go to Girls State just in early June. And Girls State was amazing. It's like uh, Mrs. Sittenauer said. It's you're running for different positions and you campaign and we. Uh, pass bills in the Senate and we debate other things and just to have the opportunity and get able to have the experience it's really amazing and it's one like none other and it's super amazing. 
Right. At the elementary level, we do still partner with junior achievement and we're able to access um, different careers. Uh, people bring in their own personal, uh, professional, or their professional work and uh, share that with our students. Um, and then there's curriculum that goes along with that that helps us to uh, emulate simulations of things that occur in our community. So I, I hope that you are able to hear in our voices the pride that we have to our community contributions and how we are assisting um, our community with the development of our students. And, uh, and so if you have any questions for us, we're, we're open for any. Thank you guys so much. Can you get Danita to come over so we can see what she looks like, Becky? She's not been in the camera. I know. <laughs> Well, I, I want to thank you guys for helping me out today because I could talk about it all day long, but I'm hoping that the league members um, are as excited about what's going on in our schools with civic engagement as, as I am. Um, and I've got a couple more things to cover and then we'll open everything up for questions. Um, I was asked to address a couple of other things. One was House Bill 2039, which would have mandated that the State Board of Education requires students to pass a 60 question civics test to graduate from high school. The questions would be taken randomly from the tests that we give to immigrants uh, seeking US citizenship. The State Board opposed this bill, not because uh, we opposed the notion that students ought to know those kinds of things. We just thought that there was a better way to learn them and that the bill violated the state board's constitutional authority. We oppose rote memory, high stakes tests for any student. Rote memory is the lowest form of learning and quickly forgotten. But when students live civics like they do in the Seaman district, they learn, it's authentic. We call that authentic learning. In fact, our new history test requires research, that the students make a claim, that they investigate that claim, and that they defend that claim. They actually live history and that way they learn it. Also, the graduation requirements are the purview of the State Board of Education and not the legislature. We invited the legislators to work with us on this, but they were stuck on having a test. The bill barely passed the legislature. So when the governor vetoed it, citing also the constitutional issues, um, they didn't even challenge her veto. Another topic that's made the news lately is how schools are teaching history. Yes, our schools teach history and we believe they teach it truthfully. But there's been an outcry um, by some that K-12 schools are teaching history through the lens of critical race theory. The state board unanimously approved a statement that in essence says that critical race theory is a con complex concept that examines how laws and systems promote inequality. It's an academic approach to racism that's primarily used in universities, not so much in K-12 schools. The state board sets our history standards and local districts choose the curriculum. If you look at our standards, and I encourage you to do so, you can find them at ksde.org, you will find no mention of critical race theory. But it goes beyond that, really. The folks who are up in arms falsely claim that anything regarding equity, anti-racism, culturally relevant pedagogy, restorative justice, or diversity are critical race theory. They are not. But this is a fake culture war motivated, I believe, for political reasons and designed to confuse people. And the best way to win a fake war is just not to play. I would lay down money that after November 2022, you won't hear a word about critical race theory. Instead, I choose to focus on what is really being taught in our schools. I choose to reframe the debate and tell about the good work going on in our schools, like the Equity Action Network up at Seaman, which I'm sure these uh, anti-CRT folks would have a fit about. I choose uh, to be clear. What we want is to serve all kids and prepare them to live in a diverse world. We want our schools to be safe places where students of all backgrounds have healthy self-esteem. We want to empower students to make the world a better place. So we try and teach the truth. We want every student to have the same opportunity to succeed. So at this point, um, 
I and our friends from Seaman, I'm sure will be glad to answer any questions that the league has. Carol, I don't know who's been tracking questions. If we have any, we'll take a run at it. This is Mary Lou Davis and I'm the one, Annie, in charge of questions and we have none. All Ooh. the comments that all the comments that we have are very positive in regards to what Seaman has advanced and what Seaman continues to do in, in regards to civic engagement. Uh, uh, your critical uh, race theory uh, comments, much appreciated in regards to that. It is a complex issue and one that can be uh, elaborated on and exaggerated on to the detriment of our uh, efforts in regards to community involvement and engagement. Um, also enjoyed your quick review of uh, House Bill 2039, which garnered a lot of interest throughout the state during the session and uh, glad that the governor saw fit that it was a constitutional question in regards to the responsibility of the, of the Board of Education. With that, Carol, we have uh, no questions, but lots of positive comments in regards to what our schools are doing and wishing that more people will, uh, would, would know what our schools are doing and how they're advancing and-, and uh, Mary Lou? Yes. We've had a couple questions come up, I, we, I, which we always do. Um, the uh, one I'm looking I, at is from Vicki Buning. Can you see them? I can now, yes. Want to go ahead and go through those? Well, there's one that says something about, can you tell us more about how students participate in youth court? Okay, um, let's see, yeah. Um, well, let me just begin by saying that youth court was created by Judge David Bruns, and um, he is now a Kansas Court of Appeals judge. And he asked myself as a teacher who teaches um, civil and criminal rights to uh, be a part of a, an adult board along with some law enforcement individuals and some other and lawyers and a few other people in the court system. And he wanted it to be a format um, that was incredibly similar to what a person who maybe has to go to court for any kind of an infraction, um, but it's only for people under the age of 18. And if say a student who's anywhere in Shawnee County, um, maybe gets a, a traffic violation or a misdemeanor trespassing, or even we've even had misdemeanor drug possession, um, they can go to the Topeka, um, uh, youth council and asked to have their case be put into youth court. And if they are accepted into the Topeka and Shawnee County Youth Court, they get a diversion. Uh, they don't pay as much of, of a fine. The fine, I think the, the, at the last time I looked, it was about $90. But if they had to actually go to court and pay a fine, it could have been a three or $400, especially if it was a, a, a speeding ticket that was 20 miles over or something. Um, they are then, um, go they go to youth court it's held once a month and the youth court itself is comprised of students from all over shawnee county who as i mentioned are lawyers bailiff clerk jury members and um they meet with their client the the youth offender and um in advance and they go through um the circumstances of the case and and it is very much the same as if they were going to um, a court designated um, down at the district courthouse and um, they go through a script that they follow and they um, the jury actually is in the jury box and they go to the jury room to deliberate and they're not determining if the person is innocent or guilty because they claim guilt beforehand so that that's then they get the diversion uh, but then the jury determines their punishment and the punishment usually is in the form of community service. It could be an essay, an apology to someone. It could be a number of different unique um, consequences. And uh, then they come back and they have a jury four person who um, explains what the punishment, the consequences of that person's actions might be. And then they have a certain predetermined amount of time in which to complete the uh, community service or whatever the consequences are. And um, and you know, it's just been—it's. I think it's been in operation 
maybe 18 years now. It's been quite some time. Great, great. Um, and this question is directed to you. Are you aware of other programs that are being done in other school districts in Cheyenne County? With regard to, I'm sorry, did you say to me or to Ann? To Ann, I'm sorry, okay. yeah. Yeah, the, the folks from Seaman might be better connected on that. I don't know anybody who does it as well as Seaman. They've actually won several awards, but all of the districts are to be um, doing activities on civic engagement that we laid out for them because it's part of their accreditation. Okay. And they have to, when they're accredited, explain to us what they've done. I don't know, have you guys worked with some of the other schools? Do you know more details about what they might be doing? Nope, they're shaking their heads. But every all the districts are to be doing um, civic engagement and working on the skills that, that I mentioned um, in my opening comments. And Anne, uh, what suggestions would you have for individuals like us, League of Women Voter members, where we can support civic engagement in our schools? Well, How I think do we, go ahead. Well, I think they, the, if you were looking at some of the uh, different clubs that they have and the activities that they have, my guess is they could probably use volunteers at most of those things, but just the league going to every school and talking to them about, you know, your work and the importance of voting and getting these kids registered to vote. That's, that's just huge. I know uh, Rebecca, Becky, and Danita, do you have other ideas on how you would like the public to connect with you on this? I would say we're always looking for guest speakers in our elementary schools, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be in person. The kids are, we've gotten really good at this online Zoom in type thing that maybe people could chime in and talk about it, particularly around, you know, big days like today, voting days. Um, those are some of the things we, we always need junior achievement volunteers. If anybody's willing to do that, there's, there's lots of opportunities uh, to support the schools. For that secondary. I, I would also, I would add to that, that sharing our story with the public would also be very important. Sometimes our com uh, the community at large does not uh, know all the good things that happen in school. So when you are familiar with those, if you could share our story so that um, everyone realizes that we're all doing just great things for kids and that we're providing the opportunities our students deserve to be con uh, co uh, contributing members. We do have a question and you touched on it in regards to working with students and impressing upon them the importance of registering to vote. Do you have any concerns or qualms of talking about registering to vote in view of the law that has been passed uh, whereby individuals could be perceived as election officials? Either Ann or the teachers at Seaman, I'm you have comments in regards to that? I'm not familiar with that. Susan, are you, and what are your thoughts? I'm not familiar with the, the the connection between um, the league giving us a presentation about the importance of voting and anything with regard to election workers. Uh, well, let me let me jump in and see if this helps. Yeah. The new law that they passed um, says that if you're out registering people to vote and the people you're registering believe that you're impersonating a county election officer even though you may not be, but if they think you are, you could be convicted of a crime of impersonating an election officer. And so to that end, the League of Women Voters and some other organizations have just stopped registering people to vote. Now I would think in the school, if your government teacher's talking to you about how to register to vote, the kids probably wouldn't confuse you with an election official, but that's kind of where they're going. Do you have any concerns with that new law that you're gonna to have to stop talking to kids about registering to vote. I mean, as a person who's listened to their presentation many times, I don't think in any way the league comes across as um, influencing as far as our election workers. They're very nonpartisan. They're very neutral. Um, I, I don't 
I don't personally see that, but I don't know how comfortable the league feels then as a result of that law. I, think I, would, hop in, I would hop in if I can. We're, we're kind of in the state league has asked they all the leagues around the state to just kind of hold off for a while because there's a court case trying to make that law, shine the light on that law and make it clear. Uh, so we're kind of in a position of informing and recruiting right now. And hopefully this will be solved soon. We can so, hope. So does that mean that you would um, not want, does that mean you would not want us to um, contact you this fall about voter registration? No. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> do, for it? Do, do contact us this okay. fall about voter registration by all know, means. I didn't know if you're waiting for that court case or, or what. No, we're moving forward, Susan. Yeah, yeah. we're not going to go away. <laughs> but I think it's also good that you now know uh, in regards to some of the details of that law, in regards to if you're questioned about that by any student that's out there that maybe has a very knowledgeable parent that has uh, approached that. We have time, I think, Carol, for one more question. And that's, we're going to direct that to Olivia. Uh, your comments, there was, a con there was some dialogue about comments to the board that you're going to make next week. Will you share some of those points with us or is that premature? Um, I think I can. It's basically everything that we'll be sharing on August 9th is um, public knowledge or soon will be public knowledge. Um, we met as a council or a committee um, in late July, I think it was July 26th, and what we've put out so far that has been on the district website and we've been um, engaging in the community, um, two people on the board, including myself, are doing some more research on some few topics surrounding um, the community and the history, and then um, three other people on the board are um, implementing a program called the Red Couch, and they're just going out into different areas and seeking different people's stories and conversations. And then the last part of that is the survey that we sent out. Um, we've gotten many, many responses and um, very excited to look over that. So basically what I'll be presenting to the board and I'll be presenting with two other um, women from the board is just what we've been doing and what we plan to do in the future. So if you'd like to hear a little bit more about that, then it will be live streamed or you can come down to the district office, but. Great. Very good. Thank you, Olivia. Carol, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thanks, Mary Lou. I, I want to say thank you so much and for a great idea and bringing on Susan and Rebecca and Olivia and the name I can't remember, I'm sorry, right there. Um, um, your, and Kelly, your presentations and your real stories just made me understand so much more that's happening in the schools right now. And uh, on election day, that makes me kind of happy and optimistic toward the future. So thank you all so much.